in your view, uh, what are the most Im important achievements of the of NATAG? There were many, but I can remember that when they were when they came, we didn't have what is called a, a this thing, an Armed Forces Act, which they helped to develop. We didn't have also what is called a TACOS, that is the terms and conditions of service for both soldiers and officers. I, Mamat O. A. Cham, swear that I'll speak the truth. Swear that I'll speak the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. Good morning, Mr. Cham. Uh, thanks for uh, appearing before the, this commission. Can you, what is your full name, please? My name is Mamat Cham. Where, what is your date of birth? Well, I was born around 1961. Uh, where were you born? I was born in Kirmbuguma village, Lower Nyomi, North Bank Division. Uh, where do you live now? Presently, I have a compound in Sukuta Salaj, and that is where I am living. Uh, can you tell us briefly your educational background? I was enrolled in Charmen Primary School, which is about two kilometers from Buguma, and went to Crab Island Junior Secondary School. This was in 1973. I left school in 1977. What did you do after you finished Crab Island Secondary School? I got a temporal job with the Ministry of Local Government as a registration clerk, the people who go around the country to register citizens for elections around six months and then after that it was over. Did you find another job? I also enrolled to do some private studies and then eventually sat to the GCO level. After the GCO level I also taught one year and then I was appointed as a second supervisor and posted to Nyani Maro in the Nyanija district. For how long did you work at the cooperative union? I worked for two years plus some months. Returning to Banjul, I went back to private studies and then sat to the GCA level, December 83. What did you do after your A-levels? I was uh, enlisted into the Gambia National Army on the 16th of July 1984. Would I take it from that? That, that yours was the first batch of military intake? Yes, we were designated as the first batch of the Gambia National Army. And uh, what happened after you finished your training? After the training, we had a two weeks leave. I think I, I appointed as a Lance Corporal, which is the first rank in the Army. Then, before I was decorated, I was promoted to the rank of a, an officer cadet. Were you alone in that promotion? Uh, no, I, I think if I can remember well now, uh, there was uh, another soldier, Modu Kamara, uh, Sam Jiba, I think if I can remember also Modu Baji, was also part of the soldiers, and then we had some civilians, among which were Pasala Jain, Lawrence Jara and one Gasama. And uh, you were all promoted to the rank of officer cadet, correct? Uh, no. I think among the soldiers it was myself, Modu Kamara, and uh, Sam Jiba who made it through. And then among the civilians, I think Pasala Jain and Lawrence Jara made it through. Uh, did you pursue any further training? Certainly. After my promotion to, an, to the rank of an officer cadet, I served briefly in Yundum. And then in April, we had some scholarships from the United States government. It was uh, referred to as an IMET, International Military Education and Training Program, 
which were grants from the American government. And then I was uh, selected together with uh, then office, uh, Officer Cadet Babu Karjata and uh, Officer Cadet Captain, uh, Officer Cadet Sise, Fabakari Sise, to proceed to the United States for military training. Do you recall which year this was? Uh, this was uh, around May 1985. After the infantry officer basic course, I also did an infant, a motor infantry platoon commander's course, and I also did an airborne training, which was uh, what we call parachute, before moving on to the Special Warfare Center in North Carolina. Do you recall when you returned to the Gambia? Yes, I think the, the, whole, the whole package lasted for about 13 months, and I eventually returned to the Gambia sometimes in 1986. I was posted to the then Confederal Battalion at the Kudang camp. For how long did you serve in Kudang? I didn't stay very long in Kudang. I think one month into my postings at Kudang, uh, there was an occurrence at the Katong deployment, which was also another camp of the then Confederal Battalion. The officer who was posted at Carton, then Lieutenant Wilson, I think had, had a football match. The, the soldiers had a football match with the villagers. And then after the, they were defeated by the villagers, I think it didn't go down well with them. And then there were some squirrels. And then I think he decided to impose a curfew. So he was, uh, he was recalled. And then I was substituted in his stead. And for how long did you serve in this capacity in Katong? If I can remember very well, I served about, uh, about 18 months before eventually I was posted back to Yundum and I was replaced by then Lieutenant Samsudin Sar. I was promoted to the rank of a captain and then I was appointed as the adjutant of one infantry battalion. What does the role of adjutant entail? Adjutant in, a, in an infantry battalion is more like the secretary to the co commander. You coordinate the administration of the battalion. Of course, you have a pool of uh, what is called uh, odd, an oddly room. That is where all the write-ups are made. But you make the write-ups for the commander. You, in a, in a proper regimented army, the adjutant is normally the most junior captain. So, but because of the appoint appointment, you are also, you do the work for the commander for him to go and play golf or whatever. That, would you agree that that makes you closer to the real power within the barracks? Well, you are a confident and a trusty to the commander. And then most of the time, when policies are made, you have some input and influence, yes. Would you consider that as a privileged position? Well, you can call it a privileged position, but then it was like a merit-based appointment because they consider your competence not only as an officer, but also your integrity and your ability to, to, to write. And for how long did you serve as adjutant? I think I served for over one year. And then eventually I was succeeded by, then I think if I can remember very well, Captain Ann. And I was posted to Bravo Company as the company commander. And uh, do you recall which year this occurred? I think this was... Uh, if I can remember, the chronology is a little bit distinct, but I think it was between 91, 90, yeah, around, around 91. And then I think I didn't stay long at, uh, as a company commander. I eventually was uh, sent to Pakistan at the School of Infantry in Quetta to do my uh, mid-career course, which was the company commander's course. 
What did you do upon your return from Pakistan? Upon my return to Pakistan, I, if I can remember, either before or after going to Pakistan, there was a moment whilst I was the commander of Bravo Company when there was a mutiny by some of the soldiers who had returned from Liberia before. Can you tell us about that mutiny? Well, the soldiers, if, uh, I think, had some dissatisfactions about uh, their conditions. I think the claim was that they were promised that they would be paid upon their return a bonus, which I was not aware of, but then they, they discussed among themselves. And then not all of them, a group of them, decided to do a mutiny, but this was a mutiny without violence. They decided that they were not going to report for their normal duties and then gathered around the commander's office. What happened when they gathered around the commander's office? When they gathered, I think uh, the commander consulted with some of the officers and then we decided to take them to one of the training rooms and I think he also invited the then uh, Zandarmari commander, uh, who was a major, major, major Pasala giant. And then there was also the British training team. There was a lieutenant colonel, I forgot the name, and one uh, sergeant major, I think if I can remember it was Selos. We spoke to them and then told them that that was against the military order and that if they had any grievances, they should uh, channel it politely, and then it will be adjudicated and dealt with according to the army rules then existing. Who was the commander of the army at this time? The commander of the army was Colonel Ndawunjai, Mamadou Ndawunjai then. Did the soldiers accept or heed to the advice they were given? No, certainly they didn't. I think after one or two hours of you know bantering, some of them decided to bust out of the of the room, and then some attempted even to 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 wrestle some guns from from our security deployment, which then as the company commander in charge we 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 resisted and then drove them out of the barracks. What happened after that? After that, they went to the uh, to the road from Birkama heading to Westfield. I think they commanded a GPTC bus then, and then drove headed to Banjul. Do you know what happened in Banjul when they arrived there? I think we we were able to contain them briefly at the bridge, and then later they were allowed to assemble at the then Makati Square, where con uh, the commander of the GN then Daunjai eventually joined them with Pasala Jain and then went to the presidency. And then after some discussion, they came and then were able to convince them to, to calm down and then to return to the barracks. Do you recall the date this event occurred? Certainly not, but I think it was within the general time. But the exact date I cannot recall. It must be uh, in the in the in the uh, in the historical records. I'm sure you can dig it out. 1990 would it be at around that time? 1990, 91. I I'm not very sure, but I think it it was a very significant happening. So it we can locate the dates very well. How many soldiers participated in this mutiny? I think, if I can recall, between 60 to 80, if I can remember. Were any officers involved? No, no officer was visible, no officer was mentioned. I think it was led by the non-commissioned officers. Uh, the one I can remember then was one Sergeant Drame. And then there was also another Lance Corporal Bojang from Birkama. Were any disciplinary measures taken against any of these soldiers? 
Yes, I think when they eventually were persuaded to come back to their senses, they were brought to, to Yundum, and then we gathered them around the, the, the training pitch, and then after addressing them, we, 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 we detained some of them and took them to mile two. Why did the army do that? Well, as I said, mutiny is not <laughs> part of the business of a soldier. The soldier's lot is to do and uh, to do what he's told. If he has any complaints or any thing, he can uh, politely make his case within the chain of command, and then I'm sure you, within the space of the military justice system, if the complaints are genuine, it could be addressed. Do you recall how many officers were, how many soldiers were taken to mile two prison? I think not all the 80 were taken. We, 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 we screened them, and those who were found to be the instigators were taken. And then after that, I think there was a, a board of inquiry, a BOI, that was set up, if I can remember very well. Then permanent secretary of local government, I think, Tal, Mr. Tal, uh, he's currently serving, I think, at, uh, in Nigeria in our mission as the ambassador of the Gambia to Nigeria, was, was the head of that inquiry. And uh, what happened to your career in the military after that? Following that, I was posted to, to Liberia as the fourth contingent commander to take over from, I think, then Captain... Abdullahi Conte. Uh, what did you have to do in Liberia? In Liberia, I was not only the contingent commander for the Gambian detachment, but I was also a, con a contingent commander assigned by my government to the headquarters of ECOMOC. And I was appointed, my appointment at the ECOMOC, which was reserved for Gambian, was to be the camp commandant of the headquarters, responsible for coordinating the security of the ECOMOC headquarters. And what did you do when you returned? To proceed to Nigeria to the Command and Staff College at Jaji to do a course as a, G, a, a, a JD, what we call JD, Junior Division Staff Course. And what did you do after your return in end of December 1993? Upon my return, I was posted to the two infantry battalion, which was then being set up in Farafene, as again as a company commander, and also being the most senior captain, I was appointed as the second in command to the then commander who was a Nigerian Lieutenant Colonel, Salik. Apart from training, did the Nigerians carry out any other functions, apart from training and advisory functions? Did they carry out any other functions? I think the consequences of the mutiny I earlier mentioned was that after the, we settled the problem, the then commander Daunjai was uh, redesignated. I think uh, he was, he was uh, posted as the Gambian ambassador to France. And then in the interim, Major Maba Job was appointed as interim commander of the Gambian National Army. And then during that period, it was during that period that the government of uh, the Gambia approached the then government of Nigeria on the, if I can remember, General uh, Babangida. And then I think there was an assistant package to the Gambia in the form of a military training and advisory group composed of a high level senior officers and junior officers and non-commissioned officers under the command of Dada who was asked, tasked to command, not only to train but also to command the Gambia National Army. Yeah. From your answers, it appears that you're suggesting that the Nigerians also took up command position. Is that correct? Certainly. Uh, not only were they tasked to train the Gambia National Army, but as you would recall, then when Ndaunyai was uh, appointed as uh, 
an ambassador to France. I think there was no senior officer early on. Then uh, uh, Colonel Gay, Lieutenant Colonel Maud Gay, was also retired for some reason. And then most of the highest echelon of the Gambian command was a major, which was Major Mabajop, and then Major Malik Njai. Malik Njai was not a regular, regular, a regular a combat regular commission officer. He was a, a medic, and Mabajop was uh, briefly appointed as the as the interim commander. But I think the the wisdom of the then government, they felt that there was a need to bring in more mature, if I may call it, if I may use the word, or more seasoned officers to help us through to set up the proper army and establish the proper regimentation that all professional armies will require. And in that arrangement, uh, the Nigerians also assumed command responsibility for the Gambia National Army. Is that right? Very well, that is true. Could you kindly describe to us the levels at which the Nigerians were placed as, as commanders? I think the, 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 the position of the commander, Gambia National Army, was a Nigerian. There was also two full bad colonels, Colonel Awonibi and Colonel Akoji, who were appointed as one was Colonel G1 and the other was G2. One was responsible for uh, training and operations. The other was responsible for admin and logistics. And then below them, we had the battalion commanders. There were also two Nigerian lieutenant colonels. One was uh, appointed commander of the one infantry battalion in Yundum. The other was the, the Colonel Salik I earlier mentioned, was appointed uh, the commander of the then uh, two infantry battalion in Farafene. And below them, we had various staff officers. And uh, some of them were lawyers. Some of them were, they were doctors. Uh, they were other officers who were appointed in the training rules, etc., etc. This was a period of transition, which was a difficult one. So essentially what it meant was that the Gambia had no capacity skill capacity to run a modern army. So you said that the Gambia did not have capacity at the time to run a modern army. Uh, uh, could you explain the rationale behind giving Nigerians command responsibility as you understood the situation, of course? Certainly, I think I was not a party to the decisions to contract the Nigerians to come and command the army. But I think in my own level, at my own level, I felt that the political masters then perceive that, you know, raising an army needs mature guidance. And uh, in the absence of seasoned officers at the local level, then Nigeria having gone through similar uh, colonial rule and then had a similar administration and a similar uh, doctrine for running an army, became a natural you know, partner and ally that we can resort to and then probably see us through that interim time until such a time that Gambian officers could be trained and then to, uh, guided through to, to assume their national duties as uh, commanders of a sovereign armed forces. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Witness. Uh, but help us here. Prior to the arrival of the Nigerians, uh, didn't we have Gambians in these particular positions, which the Nigerians came to assume later? I think I did state that Colonel Daunjai, who I understand was a career police officer following the 1981 events, was appointed as the commander of the Gambia National Army. So yes, we, we had some, some security personnel, but certainly not army qualified personnel. 
So the process of recruiting, training, and equipping an army, you know, is, uh, takes some time if you are to do it properly. So that not only is the officer supposed to be intelligent, educated, but he also must have some maturity because uh, an army is not any other institution. We, we manage violence, and therefore you need to have stable and reliable and dependable commanders who are mature and who understand the, the, the national situation to make sure that you know, they, they, they guide the young soldiers and officers maturely for continuity. So from that answer, do I take it that your view or your understanding of the situation um, is that there was a maturity gap in the leadership of the army and uh, the government deemed it necessary, therefore, to bring in more seasoned personnel from Nigeria to guide the army in that development stage. Is that right? Yes, certainly. That was my, my view. Uh, you ultimately became staff officer at headquarters, correct? That's true. Were you the only Gambian who served at headquarters? No. I think there were some other officers. As I said, the, the process of the training was not only recruit training, but also command training and also staff duties training. Because to, an army needs both commanders and then the staff who will prepare the policies, the plans, and the logistics with which to, 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 to conduct operations. So in the process, I think I was among others. Uh, I can remember Babu Karjata was also at the headquarters. If I can remember, there was also some second lieutenants. Was it the idea uh, that upon the departure of the Nigerians, the mentees would replace them in their positions? I think that is the national, uh, natural succession of uh, events. Of course, as I stated earlier on, I was not a party to the decision to contract the Nigerians, but I thought that the political leaders then, you know, had a plan with which the, the Nigerians would be, would be guiding the Gambia National Army for a period with a view, end view that, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the tunnel, uh, they will identify qualified, mature Gambians to succeed them. And in that regard, the Nigerians would be responsible for making recommendations as to who should occupy what position, correct? Well, it is the responsibility of any commander to the political master to recommend not only the policies and the logistic requirement, but also the, 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 the personnel whom, in their view, would naturally be able to carry the, the responsibility of commanding the, the, the army. In your view, uh, what are the most Im important achievements of, the, of NATAG in the Gambia National Army? I think there were many, but I can remember that when they, were, when they came, we didn't have what is called a, a distinct an Armed Forces Act, which they helped to develop. We didn't have also what is called a TACOS, that is the terms and conditions of service for both soldiers and officers, which defines what are going to be the terms of and entitlements of the officers and soldiers. And then also in the restructuring process, we didn't have the, the structures, as I said, the, the various structures that will not only give the service support required to run the army, but also designate what the, the terms, of, uh, terms of reference for all these various structures are. And I think they did very well in that domain. Because up to now, I think basically we are using you know, what we inherited from them. 
Are you referring to the regimentation of the army? Yes, certainly regimentation is also a very important aspect of running an army because in the army we, we have various ranks and then it is important that everybody understands where you are and then to do what you are required to do in a disciplined and orderly manner and also a predictable uh, way, manner of responding. As a commander, you would also, every time you, 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 you go to your unit, you expect a particular response. So that is part of the regimentation, yes. And it is your view that they did very well when it comes to organizing this army in that manner? Well, certainly, though it takes longer than the period they state to be able to do it properly. As I said, you know, these are, these are organizations, and like all natural organizations, you know, there is also not only the objective uh, situation, but there is also an, a subjective situation. And the subjective may sometimes influence, you know, the end result of the objectivity of whatever you do. Now let's talk about the conditions that prevailed in the army between 1990 and 1994. In your view, what, what was it like? for the soldiers in the army between 1990 and 1994? I think you, you mean between 1990, 1984 or, or to 1994 or what? 1990 to 1994. I think... I think... We will we will look at it from from 1984, because to establish and run an armed forces requires a lot of capital investment. It only not requires building of proper barracks, uh, procurement of equipments, the clothing of the soldiers, and then the acquiring of uh, vehicles and other logistics, uniforms, etc. So at any given time in a, in, a, in a developing country like the Gambia, I think there was always a gap between what the ideal and what was available. So in terms of the conditions, the, the situation was, was to Gambian standard acceptable, but I wouldn't say compared to other well-resourced countries, it was, it was below, below what was normal. Tell us about food for the soldiers. Well, certainly food has always been, you know, an issue, if I may say so. Uh, maybe there is always an inadequate uh, fish money or whatever you call it, because the, the feeding is composed of two things. There is the hard ration, which was procured centrally, and there is what is called the condiments aspect, which was a sum of money that was given depending on the size of the unit, to the cooks or the ration clerks to go daily and procure from the market. So with all those things, the preparation also was also a problem because it depends on the ability of the cook to manage what was available and then to cook it to be edible. Was the food up to standard? Well, standards are a relative term. When you say was the food up to standard, it means you have a scale. So I don't know what was your barometer then. Was it good enough? It was edible compared to what was available generally in society. I think it was okay. General, grass may be edible, but was it good enough? Well... Grass was not, it was not compared to grass. It was, uh, we, we use a common term that was water, water, chew. Yeah, but water, water, chew means that the texture of the, of the sauce was not thick enough. But it was edible. There, there was always a piece of meat or a piece of fish, some vegetables, and rice. And it tasted salt. Well, it tasted sometimes when, the, when it is domoda, it's fine. When it is uh, chew, 
which which was sometimes difficult because of the the proportions were not properly <laughs> uh, this thing calibrated then it becomes sometimes difficult would you say that the soldiers were happy about the food well again happiness is a relative term what i term to be good and i can do it will be different from your taste and as you know the the soldiers were coming from different strata of gambian society so but by and large we were able to to survive able to survive are the words you used well suddenly yes do i take that to mean that uh it wasn't the best, but you were able to manage with it. It wasn't the best, fine, but it was also okay for, for the purpose. It was fit for purpose, I would say. You're speaking like a general in the army. Well, probably I'm not conscious of, of that this thing, but certainly yes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Witness. How about housing? Well, housing, we inherited what was then Yundum, Yundum College. And uh, if I remember very well, the genesis of that, that barracks was, it was at one point a poultry, poultry farm. And then later it was transformed to the then Gambia College for the training of teachers. When Birkama campus was built and the army was being formed, I think we inherited it from, from government. So I think some people would, would, know, would know that place better, those who are teachers. And then we have some running water, there were some toilets, and then there were dormitories that we had beds in. And then suddenly uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a livable quarter. Was it adequate for the soldiers, for all the soldiers? No, certainly not. It was not adequate. And then some of the officers and the senior non-commissioned officers were allowed to rent houses in town and commit to work daily. Uh, before we conclude the point on the housing issue, perhaps I'll just go back to food. Um, was there any point in time when the issue of the quality of the food was viewed as a problem by the soldiers? Well, when I was in Yundo, during my recruit training, I think there was, we were not always very happy with the food, but then again, at that time, I think our salaries were about 186, and then 60 was being deducted as for feeding. Okay, so, well, there were always some, some, some issues about whether the food was good enough, whether we were, we were having a fair deal or whatever. But by and large, well, it was not out of, out of, out of the normal, certainly.